Because um, Kim was like, came in for the, for the well, we had, um, some of you were thinking George Ferreo was coming, and George couldn't make it at the last minute, and Kim has graciously stepped in to discuss, actually I'm thrilled because I've been dying to see this lecture, she's done in other places, on um, framing. So um, without further ado, Kimberly, I'm turning it over to you. This is Kim Warren Linus. <laughs> Okay, um, first, thank you for coming to my demo and not watching the Bruins game. For those I knew with an art crowd, maybe you would set your DVRs or such, but my husband, of course, was like, the demo's tonight, you know. Uh -huh. Yeah, exactly, so. <laughs> um, so anyway, thank you. And then also, this has really worked out nicely that uh, Frank, one of my students, has his work all up here. So he had said before, um, years ago, I did this demo. I had a projector and all these photos from a show that Frank had done in the library. And I basically explained why all his frame choices were bad. And um, it was, he was so wonderful. And everyone just started feeling bad for him. And I was just like, oh, Frank, you know, this frame, eh. You know, and since then, like I'm sitting here, and there's only like two frames that I'm thinking were suspect choices. You know, um, but also I'm very proud of the work that he's done. Like, what a strong show with some really wonderful figures, particularly and some dappled light over there. So, um, we'll spend a little time talking about frames that Frank has chosen for his really strong painting. So, um, also. I pulled in some favors from some framers. Say that fast. And um, so Julie at Custom Art Framing in Gallery 9 has offered this very classic black frame with a gold lip, uh, 8 by 10, for our raffle today, as well as a nice little small 6 by 6 black with glass. Okay, so um, the Grand Poobah raffle prize and the runner up. Right. Right. Um, generally, everyone can use some level of those frames, right? Um, also, I've talked to Julie as well as Matt at Preservation Framer in North Attleboro. I think both of these places are really great local framers. Um, not to disdain anyone else, these are the ones that I've befriended. I recently moved from North Attleboro to Norfolk, so these are going to be kind of my home base frame shops. Um, and I'll discuss later that I have some great deals, but I cannot just pass them out willy-nilly and say, here you go, here's a ton. It's, they're counted, they're, like, there are codes on them so that they know that they came from me so that you guys will get good deals and we'll talk about that. Um, also my card. Oh, and silly, Julie was, she came upon this box of pencils. I'm telling you, there are probably a million pencils in her store right now. Everyone is entitled to a dozen black, like cute, wonderful pencils. I have boxes. Um, I opened up, before. there are 24 dozen pencils here with more over here. I wasn't sure how many of you would come. So anyway, at the break. Come talk, to, we'll talk about the, or at the end, we'll talk about the discounts at which frame shop you think you may want to visit and say, Kim was awesome and talked about you so pleasantly, right? <laughs> and then um, take a dozen pencils. My God, right? We're artists, we need pencils. Okay. All right, so I started with a little bit about me. So some of you have seen me do demos on painting, and so. Here's my demo on framing, right? Um, my first job in framing was in 1993, and when I did the math, I was like, oh my gosh, that's a lot of experience in framing, you know, like, um, I have 14 plus years of working in art-centered positions that have a focus on framing. And so it's, yes, I'm an artist, but I'm an artist with this kind of funky uh, knowledge base, right, which, 
I think if I can share some of it with you would benefit you. Um, I managed galleries uh, in Boston and that included Faneuil, well I was the general manager, so it included Faneuil Hall and Newbury Street and uh, Milk Street in the financial district. And it was kind of funny, I didn't know Boston very well when I got this position, so I only knew how to get to Cambridge if I went by Newbury Street, do you know what I mean? <laughs> so, um, but also Cape Cod, like, and I, so I learned things about framing and customers' tastes and costs that were very valuable to me later when, rather than selling the art, I realized I could make the art too. Um, okay, so, uh, this, is called framing for artists. This isn't about specific framing because that's kind of another topic which I'm going to presume a lot of you know because you're generally framing your own work, you frame stuff for your house. This is framing as a business. We know it's very expensive. We know there are myriad options. So this is trying to kind of square root what are good choices for the professional framer trying to make money in this starving artist business. At any time, interrupt because I might uh, take a tangent or get scattered. Um. <laughs> okay. um, I recently had a show in Boston and um, I got lots of compliments and it was really kind of humbling because it's a new market that's kind of exciting and it feels like, yeah, I had a show in Boston. And the funniest thing happened a couple of times, like I would get emails from people who had seen the work and um, Let's say if I got six emails, five of them mentioned my framing. And you know, it was usually, oh, I love your work. Oh, it's luminous. Oh, it's this, it's this. And it was like, oh, that's so nice. And then a framing concept, I mean, comment. Like, your work is framed perfectly. <laughs> and it was, well, thank you, you know, I've been working at that. But it's a something that you don't necessarily know is being noticed. And it's important, so. Dun -dun. All right, so here are my questions. So how many here are artists? Yes, everybody, just about right. And how many are like professional artists selling your work and trying to at least subsidize your art supply costs, right? Yeah. Um, so then the question is, how many among you have a consistent framing strategy? What do you mean by that, right? Um, and look in my notes, I wrote, aha. You know? <laughs> um, I found it very important to come up with this strategy that would, I feel like I'm doing some sort of infomercial, but it's not. <laughs> um, it's really important if you have a strong artist voice, your framing should be very simple because if it's this size and this medium, I should be able to pop it into here. If I'm working in pastel, I generally buy my sheets in bulk and I do always the same size, so if something doesn't sell, I can swap it out of that frame kind of thing. You know, so that's what we're going to talk about. And like I said, any questions, any comments? Um, okay, so, done, done. Uh, how many here have good relationships with a local framer? Um, and I'm, yeah, right? I like that. Um, and by no means am I disdaining the big box stores too much, right? I am just talking about the small frame shops that, if you befriend them, can be your best friend. And, um, and I think it goes to, you guys might know, like I'm a huge advocate for small mom and pops. I had a small store. Um, I have been, um, you know, like an advocate for small business in Norwood, you know, so obviously this is my bent. And this is a good time too to say, you need to know this is opinion, but it's based on the experience that I gave you. And some of you might have different feelings, and that's fine. And in fact, I'd love to discuss, you know. Um, so the relationship with your framer is important. You, they can do wonders for you. Um, I have been the recipient of such wonderful pricing, uh, gifted supplies, you know what I mean? Like, uh, and I just find it very important. 
I did this coaching for um, a recent graduate uh, from one of the art schools. She was a fiber arts graduate, and she was just like, I don't know what I'm going to do with my life. And so the mother called me and was like, can you please just talk to my poor daughter? She doesn't know what to do. And we had the nicest conversation over coffee. And I said, so where do you buy all your fiber art stuff? And she said, Joanne Fabrics. And I was like, no. Go to Dee's Nimble Needles. Go to, you know, like mom and pop fabric stores. Go somewhere, like a little quilt store. Befriend, you know, like these people. Because the people who go there are also going to want to um, get to know you. You might have knowledge to impart to them, you know. So this is part of being the artist, bringing in great work. Um, they'll see it if they have a gallery they might approach you hey I'd love to have your work in my gallery you know all of these things are good um, they might also like Juliet custom art framing always says I have something in my garage you know like this molding that I got I'll, I can cut six frames for you you know so if they like you you always get some great deals generally okay I asked a gallery owner the most important thing for artists to remember about framing and they said quality representation so I know as a judge for art shows sometimes I've not given awards because of the frame selection either it just didn't feel special or it felt slapped in or it was way too ornate you know like there's a real delicate balance uh, appearance makes a difference make sure it's quality presentation so here's the thing that's sometimes tricky and it's think of framing even before you begin a painting or a photo series or anything right um, it'll be kind of confining for you perhaps you know like um, and this is where it transcends this isn't for a hobby this is I love doing this and I'm going to try to sell so I have a show coming up in Marion like a little arts on the park thing this summer and so I'm thinking, like, I might want to take a departure from what I normally do, maybe get some driftwoody frames and do some pen and inks of shells, inspired by someone in my class. So, um, you know, like, think of the framing before you start a series of work. And I'm always a big advocate of series because, you know, uh, many artists might be fickle. I know I'm fickle. I only ever work like this until I get bored of that And then I only work like this. So when I say have a consistent framing strategy It doesn't have to be like for your life. It's just for that stage All, all good. All right um, Good framing can be simple or over the top but I find good strong art does not need bells and whistles Right, so I'm trying to select frames at Julie's that she's willing to donate. And she has gorgeous frames with these beautiful Art Deco carb stuff and this distressed great stuff. And it's no, like this is framing for artists and you people are all, you know, like talented, plying your craft. So we selected black with a gold lip and a simple black frame. We want your art to be the one that stands out and not detracted by your frame. Now, if you're framing, you know, like your diploma or your kids for drawing or stuff, that's all different. And that's why they have a zillion bajillion frame choices at the galleries, you know. But, um, you know, for us at a certain level, this can be um, an economical way to go. All right. So we know about mats, right? <laughs> this is the tiniest mat ever. Um, mats are important because, right, they, they give your eye a little <laughs> visual rest. Especially if your frame is busy, sometimes you need that. If it's a medium that requires some distance from the glass so it doesn't adhere or smudge, mats are important. What also is kind of interesting about mats is they're a cost. So when a framer is giving you matting, right, it's you get frame, you get glass, backing, now you're adding matting, and everything just got bigger. So it's one of the biggest price increasey kind of things that a frame shop can do to make money so it's kind of like all the candy bars at checkout you know what i mean it's what's your add-on and hey it looks great with one mat maybe two you know more ka-ching if a framer 
advises you that you don't need a mat, take that to heart because um, they're basically cutting in a lot on their profit margin, you know? So it's kind of a fun thing to know. I'm seeing a lot of no matting and I think um, it feels a little bit more like, uh, like a, you know, some classic museum styling of framing. And you can do that with any, with watercolor, with photo, um, with pastels and with oils and acrylic, etc. Okay. Um, when matting, you know, and I'll say all this and then I did these wacky shaped long things with this crazy dark blue mat and then these suns, they didn't sell. And I think they didn't sell because the mat, like the mat uh, limited the number of people who could hang this piece. You know what I mean? By the color. By the color. And sometimes you have, um, okay, and when I, when I framed, designed framing for people, we would put the artwork down and we would do that, you know, squint crazy so that you would just see values. And you would try to pick a mat that was the appropriate value that you saw the most of. So generally white, black, or gray, or some shade within. So, you know, you're always kind of trying to be neutr neutral. And sometimes pieces really need mats, and sometimes they don't, you know. Haiti, just to point out, you have this one piece that's a gorgeous watercolor that was at your show at Patriot Place that has a really thick gold frame. I think it's peaches or some, mm -hmm. some sort of still life. And as a watercolor, and I remember when we designed it, it was, wow, that's different. And I know when I looked at the wall, it stood out because it's different, I think, to have a watercolor look so, I don't know, regal like that, no matte. So, um, you know, just something to consider. But if you do not use a matte, make sure your frame is wide. Otherwise, things can feel disjointed. Um, all right, let's see where we are. Um, another way to save money in framing is to know common sizes. So it's nice that lately common standard sizes have changed because it used to just be like 8 by 10, 9 by 12, 11, 14. You guys know the kind of jumps. But now you can get some really cool 12 by 12 frames, 12 by 24. They do some really nice ratios. And um, Dick Blick, you know, other catalogs will, um, or even online, there are some great um, wholesale framing options online. And uh, always order samples, though. I made that mistake once. <laughs> uh, do canvases need frames? Sometimes, sometimes no. Just make sure that your choice is deliberate. Uh, so we've talked about this in my class before, and I brought this little um, value series artist panel. Right? I like painting on panel and not canvas, um, but not always. Uh, I would tape the sides before I would start working so that it stayed clean, right? Because I'm kind of messy, right? A lot of us are when we're painting. Uh, we want that to stay clean so that when it hangs, if I'm not gonna continue my painting over the side, that it's deliberate. I went to a gallery show once in Wellfleet and the artist had thoughtfully gold leafed the sides of his canvas and that was really cool sometimes i'll just paint a solid color whatever my mood is generally some shade of pretty blue i like you know i've seen someone do a really beautiful cad red light on the sides and it um it was really dynamic i think all of it is fine as long as it looks deliberate right and consistent all right Oh yes, and the other thing that you can do, and it's like the art school trick, but you know, done well, it looks really modern and clean, is you go to your or, uh, Home Depot or whatever, and you just get that like lattice strapping, and you use little finish nails, and you put it in the sides, either of your wood support or the stretcher bars, and you let it come up a little, and it just looks like this little floater frame. At least it's a clean, finished edge. And when you do that, you nail it in at consistent intervals. It's something very pretty, you know. Um, it's kind of when I was in art school, you'd get graded on your piece, but also on your craft, and all of it matters. Okay. All right, so I've done this lecture before, and um, 
people spoke a little. I just feel like I am uh, steamrolling a little through this. And yes, please. Yes. Could we revisit the yes. watercolor paintings in a frame with no mat? With no mat, right? That's going on. Yes. Serious. Yeah. It doesn't create a moisture or it depends on where it's going. It depends on your price point, kind of. Um, so I recently dropped off a bunch of pastels to a gallery in Hingham, and some of them had spacers and some of them didn't, because I've read all kinds of contrary stories. One says only ever do it, and some say don't, you know. So okay, I don't know what to do. Um, and I've done them both. And sometimes when they're right up against, uh, it eliminates the extra layer, you know? So it wasn't smudging. In fact, it was like this really wonderful tight sandwich, you know? Uh, other times, that little layer has been a godsend in preventing um, the dusting from showing. So I think this is, uh, this is risky. If you're selling something for five thousand dollars, then you go to the hilt, you know. But the price point that I'm selling, um, I'm kind of being cost efficient, and the galleries are understanding that. Um, and another part that I address, and we can cut to, is on my pieces when I sell them. It's a story about pastel. Maybe people don't know about that particular medium, so it's why I work in it a little bit about the medium, and then also about how it's framed, so that people are aware of how it's done, and it's done with care. You know, like I use archival materials, and it's funny because, you know, in art there are no rules, right? You can put the subject right in the front. You can do anything, mixed meaning, whatever, but the rule that everyone really needs to follow is the rule of conservation and that you use the best materials that you can and, you know, like um, the acid-free things and the highest grade that you can afford. All of these things are important. Um, but in this instance, you know, I'll say no spacers per, you know, like you know, you word it appropriately, so that I think when people are buying something that they know. Does that help? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Okay. I understand. So you, Maybe not to. Yeah. So when you're, if you choose to frame a watercolor and not use a mat, yes. you can either use the spacers or not use the spacers? Yes. And you know, it's funny. I've seen some framers really angry like oh my gosh not even a spacer and it's well read your literature you'll find both and I think when it comes to glass though use good glass um, and I I don't want to jump too much hang on always conservation hey that's good that was the next thing and I already covered it right <laughs> um, all right but when it comes to glass right you can use regular and I have the prices because I call them all the places. Eight by 10, a piece of regular glass is $3. Conservation Clear, which filters 99.999% of the bad rays, is $7. So that's not much of a difference, but on that description for how it was framed and adding cachet to your work, isn't it nice to be able to say that you have conservation glass on it? And if nothing else, right, it gives it that I can't tell you how many times I've had people submit <laughs> artwork and they're like, you know, crumply. Here's, here's one of my pieces and oh, oh wait, here's another one and it's like these things, you know, no. If someone took out a portfolio and there were glassine leavings and they opened it and here was this piece so lovingly attended to, when I pick it up, I'm lovingly attending to it as opposed to the haphazard, you know. So um, I think when you're taking the care to do conservation glass and make note that that matters. Uh, okay, non-glare conservation is $14. I'm not big on non-glare. Non-glare is not non-glare, it's actually even film. And that even film um, kind of diffuses glare, but it also makes things a little bit fuzzy and a little different. Um, and then there's museum glass. <laughs> so remember that that piece of regular glass that we wouldn't really use is $3 and the conservation is 7 Museum glass is 42 um, 
Yeah, but that's where knowing your framer makes all the difference. Because, you know, maybe you have a tiny little piece. And, oh my gosh, how much is museum glass? Oh, I don't think I can swing it. The framer might be like, I have a scrap and I'll give it to you at cost. Magic new number, you know what I mean? So, so you never know. Maybe. <laughs> <laughs> um, or if they're having a special, because I do have an example with museum glass on it. And God, it is beautiful. Yes, please. You're talking about glass uh, all the time now, but so much watercolor is, is based with acrylic. Is that a problem? So acrylic, uh, it, you know, like when I ordered these frames from Dick Blick once, everything had this thin sheet of acrylic, and I changed it all because I was doing pastel. And acrylic has a funky little force field of static just because of its chemical makeup. And so I framed them and blink, oh look, there's this dust. I thought I sprayed it. I thought I had banged all the dust off. I thought I did such a good job and no, right? So uh, there's always some sort of funky static thing happening with um, a plexiglass or an acrylic front. The other thing is it scratches really easy. Um, so that's kind of hard. And you're not really supposed to use Windex on it because it'll degrade. Uh, you're supposed to use water. So, you know, I think it's one of these kinds of things. Uh, it depends on who you're framing it for. Certainly, when I enter a piece that has to travel somewhere, I'm cognizant that I should really either pack it super well and probably very expensive, or try my luck with a sheet of good acrylic. Um, I think if you were to go to one of the big box stores and get frames and they had acrylic, you might consider upgrading to at least regular glass. I think it looks better, cleaner, and it'll withstand uh, cleaning better for your potential uh, patron. Like I said, though, it's all opinion. Yeah. Kim, on some of the photographing of when you have glass on it, it's a nightmare. Yes, it, it's always a, photo before frame. Yeah, I mean, you almost can't get anything. No, no. You can. You have to like put it at a funky angle, and then when you photograph it, you need to put it into an editing software and then skew it back, pain in the neck. So the moral of the story is, uh, yeah, photo before frame. Not that we all do that. And of course, then you sell it. You're like, I don't even have a photo of it now. You know, oh well, wow. yeah. there's your reflection. Yeah, exactly. Oh. Hey, look at me with my iPhone. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> I have a whole photo album. Um, <laughs> Yeah, no, that's a good point, George, though. It is... Um, you tried to videotape a lot. <coughs> it, even the lights here, there's no yeah. way you could come up with anything to do. Anything glass yeah, on it, it's just it's yeah. distorted. Unless you, you have museum glass, because that framer really likes you. You know. <laughs> okay. All right, I, I heard this phrase once on some interview, and it was, always put your best foot forward because you never know what the universe is going to embrace. And I thought, well, that's kind of a nice thought because, you know, you haphazardly get a painting done because you have some show that people might want to buy it and you're like, eh, it's all right, someone might like it. And then that's the piece that ends up someone's buying it and then they snap a picture of it, you know, the new patron with your piece and it goes in the paper or something. And you're like, oh my God, I hated that painting. What the <laughs> heck, right? But also in framing, you know, like, <clears throat> so this is, I never knew how to pronounce it. I'm sorry. Like it's Lineco, Linico. I don't know. But this company does a lot of bookbinding materials and then archival uh, mounting products. This is self-adhesive linen hinging tape. And what's great about it is it's removable. It um, it's expensive. Oh my gosh! And I'm almost out. Look at oh. it. Um, it has a nice uh, little adhesive back. It's beautiful linen. Uh, you know, you burnish it on with a bone folder, and then you decide, oh my god, it's crooked. It comes off. You do it again. You know, it's really nice. I always try to frame my pieces with this really nice linen tape. When I couldn't afford this linen tape, um, you can use medical adhesive tape, you know, the cloth tape, because that's actually acid free. The adhesive is different, and it might not be as removable, but it's much better than scotch tape or masking tape. You know what I mean? So, um, yes, please. I know what you mean by using tape when you're painting. Oh, 
So you might do oils or acrylic and not need to use tape, but um, when I am putting the piece in the in the mat, I need oh, to okay. hinge it onto the top. Yeah, yeah, so okay. in this instance, I would use that. Um, so, but the story is, you know, like let's say I did some painting and I was out of tape which obviously I almost am. And so then I was like, well, this will do, and I put in masking tape. And then someone buys it, and they want to reframe it, and they bring it to this great gallery in California. Let's just right shoot the moon. And the gallery has a frame shop, like so many do. And oh, so I bought this painting in Massachusetts. I'm so excited. Oh my gosh, this artist is great. Wouldn't it be fun to have some Massachusetts-based, we could be bi-coastal gallery. I could contact them, and the framer or gallery takes it apart and opens it up. And oh my god, this artist used scotch tape. <laughs> You know, it's like, you just went down the rungs, right? Where it's like, oh my gosh, look, this artist really cared, did the right thing, has a little write-up. You know, it all matters. And that's that best foot forward because you never know what the universe will embrace. You know, In my pretend world, when I'm putting on my little line co hinging tape, I'm thinking <laughs> that patron is going to be so happy with my <laughs> tape choice. <laughs> <laughs> Yes. <laughs> Don't laugh too much. Um, okay. Yeah, so, okay, best foot forward did that. Artists come in, things are a mess, they don't get the respect that they deserve. You know, so that was that story about your presentation. Relationship with framers. You know, scrap pieces of everything at the frame shop are wonderful. You can use certain rag board as illustration board. You can do watercolors on certain boards. You can do pastels. You can use them as an archival ground if you gesso it. So, you know, befriend your local framer. I just can't say it enough. Um, and then they generally always have scrap little bits of white, or they can cut you some, and then you have your little cropping angles when I want to paint Rosemary's portrait, look, I've gotten rid of everyone else. Do you know what I mean? Like, so, you know, your frame shop has wonderful things. Ah, so, matting. I'm sorry, I'm jumping around, but, you know, let me know if you need me to go back. Um, we talked a little bit about matting with my little mat. Um, so, I'm big into black, not big in black really, because it looks like a black hole by right? just negative space. I'm into white in various shades. White can be purpley white, it can be greeny white, bluey white, warm white. Generally I err on the side of warm. People like warm and cozy. No one wants chilly, cold painting hanging in their house, generally. Can't say nobody. So, wide. When I first started in framing, all the mat samples were two and three quarter inches. And that was fine, you know. And people would be like, okay, and then they put the mat like this. No, you generally, I'm gonna say, you always want your mat to at least be double the width of your frame, right? So on something like this, you know, you have the latitude to make it four inches, which this sample is, or you could come in, but never, please, unless very rare circumstances, make the mat less than the width of your frame. That looks weird. It doesn't look like you even, you know, you're paying for the mat, which we know is a high profit margin. Like, make it matter. Ha <laughs> ha, mat matter. Right? Like, that's good. Um, but if you did something like a wider frame, right, see, like, that's disjointed. You need it to breathe, right? Part of the mat is that it gives your eye visual rest. And that's most important when your frame has a lot of flu flu stuff on it, you know. Um, but you know, you'll find even frames give you visual rest, you know, like this really classic has all this linear stuff and then this nice visual rest and then the linear stuff again. This is a good job, a good frame to choose for matting or no matting because this little visual rest almost acts like matting. You know, because your eye, you know, we're looking at the busyness of the artwork, not like all the busy foo foo framing at, at the professional selling, painting to sell level or photog photography to sell. Yes? Yeah, is your uh, ratio of uh, 
twice the width of the frame, is that a industry that standard? Standard, or is that just do you feel that's good, or is that something that's out there, or well, where so did that come from? Years of ex no, um, is that, is yeah. That, so that's your. It's at least one and a half. One and a half to two, and there used to be myriad um, framing periodicals, and sadly they've all kind of gone under. I think because all this small business everything is in such turmoil with the economy and not understanding the retail. But was that you know. something that they used as a formula? Yeah. Yeah, um, and yes, and to speak to that, right? So I was saying when I first started, it was two and three quarters, and now the standard is four inches. You know, so things are um, getting a well, little four bit. Four inches for what? Mat samples, oh. right? Do you know what I mean? So you can do whatever size mat is appropriate with your frame, but it's easier to show someone something when the sample is big, and then I can take the frame and come in on oh, it. Yeah, okay. Do you know what I mean? As opposed to we would have to say things like, but your mat would be out here. You know what I mean? That was always right. a little tricky. All right. So I was saying, though, mat colors. Some sort of a neutral gray, eh, some sort of warm white or white family that goes, yes. We know sometimes, though, your art, your photo is really dark and white is detracting. Then, yes, gray, black. Be careful with black. Black can just be, like I said, it just looks like this cavernous hole. We don't want that. But also, don't do what I did, that black would have probably been the right choice, and so I pick this denim blue, and then I do it on three big oversized pieces and sell none. Do you know what I mean? So <laughs> be careful. Learn from that silliness that I did. Um, so generally, a single mat on a strong piece is good, because mats are expensive, especially because now they're archival. Don't get a mat and use yucky non-archival mats. They were called paper mats back in the day. The bevel, right, that's the angle on which it's cut, will discolor. And it's ridiculous how good matting can really lend to the preservation of your art. We know that, <sighs> I'm sorry, that um, newspapers yellow in a moment, you know, especially given the right conditions. So when I first started in framing in the 90s, we did an experiment because this was all so cutting edge all out from the Library of Congress. And we framed a piece of newspaper clipping using regular and then with all archival sandwich. And the one in the archival sandwich didn't yellow. That's really amazing considering newsprint and how crummy a paper it is. So, um, Make sure that if you're matting, that you use good, um, good quality archival products. But if you aren't matting, make sure that you use archival backing because that matters too. You have really beautiful arches, watercolor paper that cost you a million dollars, and then you put cardboard behind it. Oh, that gallery that loves your work and is reframing it finds the cardboard and there you go, down the rungs again, you know. Um, so something archival. You can use cardboard because, you know, it's prevalent, but then put that scrap piece of map board that's archival that you got from your friendly framer in between. Yes. Is acid-free archival. archival? Yes, okay. and conservation. Yeah, okay. they're all kind of bandied about. Yes. You can also get, like, you know, a good archival piece of just paper like a 80 pound bond or something and that can be a barrier between if you are going to use um, something inexpensive like cardboard as a backing it all matters okay so visual space right whatever size we're using as a mat sometimes people want a double mat right i'm gonna do a little cuff of um green no 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 if you're selling Unless you're doing uh, some sort of crazy linear work or perhaps calligraphy, that, that makes sense because it's about line, right? Um, so we create shadows and we accent that little line. So double mats, um, unless the piece really calls to accent line, are expensive and specific taste driven right, for framing for artists, if that makes sense. A lot of nodding, so that's good, but not nodding off, that's also good. Um, 
If you choose to double matte, sometimes people do double mats with the same color white, and that's very rich when done in the right instance, okay? Um, when matting, though, you have options. You can do something like an eighth of an inch, which is just like this tiny little line and shadow. You can do three eighths, five eighths, a quarter, half inch, crazy big. Don't do crazy big. It starts to feel weird, like some designer gave you bad advice from some hotel lobby artwork, okay? <laughs> Be really careful. But you can do some really funky things with two mats, like my lovely little business card. Like, you can float something on something, right? And then show your mat. And you, can, you have a little bit more latitude that way, if that makes sense. No nodding, just a lot of, like my poor preschool, uh, my daughter's preschool teacher says, yeah, your daughter gets a little swirly when stuff is swirling in her head, just big wide eyes. So I'm seeing swirly people here. <laughs> All right. <coughs> Are you yeah. saying when you do the double mats? Right. So I start telling you, don't do double mats, but then if you do, make Even sure. the same color? No, not always. Oh. Okay. No. But. I'm not a fan of, of another color all the time. Sometimes the double white is very rich. And then it's about the artwork. So like if I were judging a show and someone had a double white, and let's say it was a beautiful watercolor, even a loose watercolor, but it was architectural, <coughs> then I would be like, I'm going to notice the linear aspects of this architectural watercolor. And I think that it's enhanced by the double white mat. Whereas if the under mat was, say, pink, I'd be like, oh, the artist wants me to see the pretty azalea bush that she put next to this house. Do you know what I mean? Yep. Kind of? Yep. All right. Okay. Again, lots of nodding. Yes. Yeah, would you, when you double mat like that on the bevel, would you recommend a different color? I mean, just on the bevel, ah. like edge, edge bevel. Only if it's a linear piece, a pen and ink a calligraphy something, or something that the line is very important. So his point is really great, and I want to mention that, like, this is a rag mat, and it's nice and thick, so when the bevel's cut, it's a substantial, beauteous thing, and it all matters, you know what I mean? All these things are decisions. Um, they have mats that the top is a color, like white, and then this whole thing is red. So when it's cut, you have this sixteenth of an inch or a thirty-second of an inch beautiful red line, and it comes in an assortment of some crazy colors. When used appropriately, beautiful. Like, you know those old manuscripts that, you know, it's like everything, you know, you've got the music staff, and then you've got these little music notes, and maybe some sort of a note in red. And so if you framed it with a nice clean white with that little tiny line of red, like that is so rich because it brings you back to those music staves, you know. All of this depends specifically on the series of work that you're doing. So I was doing this crazy thing where I had all these scrap pieces of paper that were three inches by three inches and I was like, let's take a risk. So I set out to do like 50 to 100 of these abstract studies and it was a good thing for me to do when the kids were napping, you know, and I was like, ah. Then I had a box of these little abstract and not so abstract pastels, so I went into my local framer in North Attleboro, and I was like, I have no idea what to do with these, you know? And what great ideas, and that's important, you know, that you have this banter. And so Matt came up with, all kinds of options, you know, like we could make it not be about the framing. It could just be a white mat with a white frame, and then all you notice are these little pieces, you know. You could just do frames, you, you know. I think all of this is important. Sometimes, you know, and like that, I tell you, make sure you know the framing beforehand. And then I tell you, no, I did this series of 100 <laughs> yeah. pieces and I had no idea what I was doing. <laughs> you know, we're artists. We know how our brains just jump sometimes, you know, so. But um, sometimes your framer can offer such wonderful suggestions. And they might just have this box of molding that wasn't quite right, but is right for your project. And they'll sell it to you half price, or what is it, whatever, right? Because they like you. And, um, I had another thought about that. So we all know framing's expensive. 
And so you have your piece and you're entering it in some show and you're so excited about it. And you get up to the counter, wherever it is, at your friendly frame shop, at your big box store that you like to go to because you have a coupon, whatever it is. And you put it down and you don't have a good rapport with the person behind the counter. You know, oh my gosh, I didn't realize the time I have to go, mm -hmm. right? Because what's the point, you know? like. It, art is so funny. It's, hi, I just put my soul on this little surface and now I'm framing my soul. Do you know what I mean? Like, if that person and you aren't jibing, like, you know, come back again. Is there anyone else who could help me? I just don't feel we're eye to eye. You know, me, sorry. You know what I mean? Like, I think that that's important. How many times are you like, oh, I'm already here. It's on my to-do list. And then you pick it up and you're like, I knew I wouldn't like it. Do you know what I mean? Like, we don't want any of that. So make sure that the whole experience is pleasant, right? It's art. There are no yucky things about art. All right, so floating. Floating is when the piece sits on the surface of the mat, right? That can be very pretty, especially if your work has a deckled edge. And that basically just means torn. I had an art teacher at MassArt who said, you never take scissors to paper. You know, you love those big nevers, right? Um, it, you always fold it a million times and tear it. 300-pound <laughs> arches, you know what I mean? Like, whatever. Um, but there is something pretty sometimes about that devil, devil, yeah, deckled edge. And then if you float it, you get to maintain that. Sometimes the edges are really pretty. Um, Okay, proportion in the mat. So that's what I was talking about, these wider mats. But then we were talking about standard sizes, right? So I have these three by three cockamamie studies that I was playing with. And um, what about getting from Dick Blick or my local art supply or my framer a bunch of eight by tens that he already has in stock and then custom cutting matting that does some sort of fun proportion, right? So we end up doing something like eight by tens and then a little opening right something like that like doesn't that look deliberate and interesting a little different right but still classic and appropriate you could do something you know what i mean really centered whatever um but it opens up this goes over here it opens up options for you um that knowing your standard sizes cut a white or warm white archival mat to fit, but maybe, you know, appropriately um, modern. Standard size mats, at general, are like too little and, and too fussy and not modern interesting that galleries would like. Not all mats are like this, but you know those mats that are on the spinners? You know, like um, at the photo developer store or at Michael's or whatever. Like those are usually ways to put your five, four by six into a nine by 12 or an eight by 10. And those proportions don't feel very clean or gallery, you know. It, for gallery framing, you know, for presentation, try to err on the side of more white space if you're matting. All right. Okay, so I have, look at my notes, right? See, little square in the, you know, so, good. All right, uh, scotch tape, masking tape, did that hinging tape, ways of mounting artwork, medical tape trick. Museum quality, front and back, so important. Glass. Mounting, right? Dry mounting is a nightmare because, have you guys seen that um, Antiques Roadshow? where that person brought in the framed collection of those really old baseball cards that were in Cracker Jack, right? And they're like, oh my gosh, I can't believe you had this. This is so excited. And all the appraisers are huddled around, all excited about this collection. And my husband's like, I know that guy. That's so-and-so, some arcane baseball name that I've never heard of, you know. And then they're like, so how did you uh, frame it? How'd you mount it? Did you dry mount it? And you're like, oh. Oh, and the guy's like, I did. And he's like, oh, that piece would be like a million dollars, but now it's only worth the paper, you know? Oh. Like, so the thing about mounting is back when I started in the 90s, mounting was a huge problem, right? Like, 
Uh, if you had some big original or an expensive lithograph or something and you dry mounted it, it basically reduced the value to nothing because you changed and altered the uh, surface of your work or the integrity of your work. Now personally, that always really bothered me because something is so wrong about looking at a piece and seeing that wrinkle and buckle, you know. Not that I was framing a ton of personal pieces that were of huge value that if I dry mounted, I would be devastated, you know. Um, but like people would be really up in arms about their diploma, you know, like I don't know if I should dry mount that. And it would come down to, well, maybe photocopy it and then we'll frame the photocopy. I don't know. But nothing is more distracting than that wrinkle and buckle under the glass. So. If you're a watercolorist, try to use really good paper. It can always, if you don't dry mount, which you probably shouldn't do for a watercolor, um, if you use a heavier paper, it won't be as prone to wrinkle. Also, before framing it, you can take your wrinkled watercolor and lightly wet the back and then weight it underneath, you know, like a nice um, archival board or book or your block of watercolor again. And when it dries, it'll be nice and flat. Um, my God, there's this blinking light thing in the back that I'm thinking is an alarm and every once in a while I catch it and I lose my train of thought. So, um, <clears throat> wrinkling. Okay. Since 1993, when I started framing, so many things have changed in terms of mounting and now the surfaces have also changed, you know, like you can do watercolor on that aqua board, which obviously isn't going to wrinkle and buckle, but it's a little different. You can use different, um, PVA size, you can use archival glues that will permanently adhere your surface to a board, provided that it's all archival. Um, and now they have this great archival mounting stuff called Fusion, which is reversible. So you can take it off of the mounting. So therefore, that whole Antiques Roadshow montage that I was uh, reenacting changes from, did you dry mount it? Yes, but I used Fusion. Oh great, you're a millionaire, you know what I mean? I mean like so um, it's important but sometimes oh and with watercolor let's say that you have 140 pound watercolor paper and you do something big and you frame it and you don't dry mount it and you bring it to a show where it's really hot outside and it gets this terrible wrinkle if it really bothers you or borrow, bothers your uh, patron, you can bring it to a frame shop and they can take it out and they can press it. And then they can put it back in. Um, so that's always something to keep in mind. With photography, that's not good. You know, it, once it wrinkles, it's nearly impossible to fix. I bought a demo from someone and it was a gorgeous pastel on really nice paper, very thin. And then it was, well, what do we do? Almost impossible to mount because it's pastel that is all smudgy, you know. So we put it in a frame. And every time people look at it, and I used expensive glass because I know the framer and she gave me a good price, you know. But, um, you know, you, thank God it's a rippled water because <laughs> it is all wrinkled. And I'm like, well, that's because it's original, you know. But it's kind of the duty of the artist, I think, to take the mounting considerations uh, in, or mounting and consider them before starting, right? So now you can buy the expensive watercolor paper, you can mount your, um, your pastel board onto something archival at the onset. If you're a, a um, an oil painter or an acrylic painter, make sure your canvas is square and nice and taut. And if it's not, make sure that it can be, re you know, restretched. You know, all of that is very important to the enjoyment of your client, right? All right. All right, write-ups on your artwork. I talked about that. Could I just ask you a question? Please. The fusion that you were talking about, is that an adhesive or is that a tape? It's a it's an adhesive. It's an adhesive. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So you know, let's say you're doing some show. You've been invited to do this big solo show. You need twenty pieces. Do a little search online for contract picture framers because 
this place that I used to work at does contract framing for hotels and big, uh, big design jobs like that. And I can remember, and this was in the 90s, like we would sell a giant piece framed for $225. And then I learned that so-and-so bought 400 of them for $25 a piece. So let's think about that, you know, ratio there, right? Like there's a lot of wiggle room. But, you know, there's also a lot of overhead for a gallery and a frame shop. And we know Michaels, and I think AC Moore, but I'm not sure, but I know Michaels does that thing. 60% off and then another 100% off your third and then something else like come on people like this is not the real you know um, there's a lot of yeah like if you went to your mom and pop you'd probably get the $200 price range when you go to Michael's you get the 600 but they're having this offer that brings you to the $200 range you know so um, you know shop around know your prices and if you're doing a ton and you have a tax ID number, look into contract framing. Um, also look into boxes in bulk of ready-made. What time is it? I'm just ranting, aren't I? Okay, 8.20. Okay. Done. Do okay. I have a question on that? Please. Oil, oils and acrylics. Okay. Cost of framing versus sale price of item. So if you have an item that sells for 250 bucks. How much should I spend on a frame yeah. for that piece? I think the formula is individual, you know. Um, and years ago, I was so flattered when a neighbor gave me a book for my birthday, and it was like the artist's, the professional artist's handbook or something. And it was all these very practical things, and it was saying, like, you need to come up with your formula almost per square inch how much you charge right and then for framing you need to figure out what ratio it is per that um i always kind of work backwards george i do this thing like how much do i think the market will bear and where am i at and where have i been does that make sense you know and then i kind of figure out how much can i pay for a frame or oh i already have that and i know how much i got that for um I wish I had developed something that were that easy, that the frame is this much, my piece is that much, that's, you know. Um, uh, so I was saying, know your local frame shop kind of thing. When I went to drop off pieces at a gallery in Hingham, I looked down, they always have those frames that, you know, were missized or maybe were done for a job that then they didn't need or something usually stacks of the same frame. I'm big on that, you know, like a uh, preservation framer in North Attleboro put on their Facebook page, you know, we have 10 9 by 12 frames of this on sale 10 bucks each to the first taker. I'm like, Rrr! you know what I mean? Like 10 9 by 12s for 10 bucks each, you know, I'm calling my husband like spending money, but it's good money, you know, because 9 by 12 I think my price is around um, 325 or something. Do you know what I mean? Like, this is a good investment. But you have to kind of figure those things out for you. Um, one thing that I wanted to say, too, is if you're on Facebook, friend or like the pages of the business cards that I have, the custom art framing and the preservation framer in North Attleboro, because both of them do offer some amazing specials that are only, you know, like it's kind of a little teaser, try to get you in. Um, and Julie gets in these ready-mades or boxes of molding, and these boxes are great for shipping pieces or for transporting a wet oil, kind of like a pizza box, but bigger, you know. And she'll put on her Facebook page, hey artist, do you need a box? I have one that's 20 by 24 to the first taker, otherwise tomorrow it's in the dumpster. You know, so if you're one of these Facebook people, it's nice to know what's going on. Preservation Framer in North Attleboro did this thing when that um, pastel of The Scream by Edvard Munch sold, and it was call up and tell us how much it sold for down to the penny, and we'll give you $50 in free framing. Stop Googling it. You know, I'm like, ready? And he's like, okay, but you exact. And I'm like, oh, and 32 cents. I'm like, you know, you want the American rate? You know what I mean? So, you know, like, pay attention to these things. They matter. Um, all right, so then I brought in show and tell. 
Is any, is so every, can I do a follow up? Yeah. If I spend more on a frame, yeah. is that going to warrant <gasps> Good any question. That was in my thought, that little light. No, no. <laughs> um, so. If I spend another $200 on yeah. a frame, is that going to jump it, the, it, uh, It's about your customer, right? Uh, so this book, it told me, like, if you sell 8x10s, all of your 8x10s need to be the same price. And I remember being like, but sometimes the 8x10 is good. And sometimes it's only good. Do you know what I mean? Like, sometimes it's like, that piece is on the postcard. And that piece is just a follow-up to that piece, do you know? And I want to charge more for this one that just flew out of me. And this one that took forever should be more. No, an 8x10 is the same price no matter what. It's like you have a chart. 8x10 in oil is this, 9x12, and you plug that in and that's your price. Framed, you should kind of be able to plug it in. Like this is how much I can charge. It's an added 50 or it's an added 100 and you don't want it framed and take half of that off. You know what I mean? Because I'm. Um, so that was a little bit funny for me to get into. I think if you have a 9 by 12 in this frame and it's X, and then you have a 9 by 12 in some ridiculously beautiful Guido on Newbury Street frame, and it's priced more, as long as it's evident why, then you can get away with it. But think about your audience, if that makes sense. I see a lot of thinking. Yeah. Kim, if you have a painting that is obviously taken a great deal of time, it's very detailed, and it's in, you know, 9 by 12. And then you have another 9 by 12, like especially in watercolor. It's very loose and beep, 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 you know. Mm -hmm. it took an hour to paint it, done, frame them both nicely. Are you saying they, you have to charge the same price for them, or you should? I think you should, hmm. and I think that it's this, well, see, this isn't about pricing for artists. This is scary, and I don't want to get too, like, no, it's all opinions, but yeah. Um, and I remember this chapter in the book, and I was a little like, really, you know. Um, if you have a consistent voice, if you are at a certain level, then yes, all of your pieces should be priced the same, based on size. And buying a, they're you know, buying a Haiti uh, early, and uh, Haiti's eight by tens are X, okay. you know, and um, it can annoy people, you know, like if, you know, because again, we never know what the universe will embrace. So that piece that took forever of some skyscrapers in Boston versus this little pair that I did, but yeah. they're both the same size. Yeah. Um, someone might love the pair, even though that Boston took forever, and then they're psyched that that pair was less money. But yet, how do you explain to the one who wants the less money one? Do you know what I mean? Like they're the same size. Interesting. Okay. All right. Yes. Uh, just one more question about framing. Let's say you're doing a watercolor, and the whole thing is together. You got your glass, mm -hmm. mat, picture, and backer. How do you hold it in the frame? Do you use nails? Do you use points? What do you do? I, I saw that sitting yeah. there, so you have yeah. a little nail gun. Yeah, so I wanted to talk about that, and I'll stop with this. And we'll go back to that if you want, but whatever. Um, I started doing these little studies, not the three by three silly thing that I was doing, but I would do these pieces that were five and a half by five and a half because they were really a good way for me to uh, spend my kids' napping time but also be productive and experiment with colors and how things went together. I did this size because I went to Ikea when they came to Stoughton and they had these wonderful, classy looking frames. Of course, I was like making notes to myself, take that one off the wall and I forgot it because it would be nice if I could show it to you. It was square, it was solid plain wood and it had a mat in it. So it might have been like nine by nine, maybe mm -hmm. nine and a half, nine and a half when it was all done, square. And it had this mat in it, and it was a nice little square opening. This frame was $5.99, and I would buy them in tens, right? 
and I would drop them off to galleries in fives and tens. And when I dropped off five new pastels in this frame, they were priced at like 95 bucks, you know, this was a while ago, then um, I would pick up frames <laughs> that were given back to the um, galleries because most of them had frame shops and they kind of were like, well, I'll upgrade the frame now. So they would take it apart. So it was kind of this great relationship where I had these frames that were presentable, but they looked kind of student, but still gallery. You know, they were almost disposable presentations of my work, right? And then Ikea discontinued them. <laughs> And they also changed what they did, and it's not solid wood anymore. It's like this glued sawdust together that's yeah. wrapped in this veneer junk. Because I tried to do these, they're the ribba frame for those in Ikea land, right? And when you get big ones, you have to kind of be really careful, and I've had to like secure them double because eventually the hardware falls out of the glued particle board. Okay, so be careful. Um, so then I was like, this is my bread and butter. This is how I'm learning. This is important to me, and now I don't have it. So I went on this search to figure out how do I replace this frame that I'm so sorry that I forgot, you know, my IKEA junk, with something better. But $5.99, like, what do you do, right? So I did Google searches, all kinds of stuff, and I ordered from this Frame USA company something that looked right online. And it was gross, and I ordered 10 of them. You know, it was like this <laughs> junky wood frame that was thin, and it came with these ready-made mats that just felt uh, flimsy. They were only $10 each, well, you know, but that's almost double where I was at from Ikea. I kind of sold some. I was kind of embarrassed about them. I sold them at a yard sale. You know what I mean? Like, take a loss, done. So then I went into Preservation Framer in North Attleboro. And I was like, I don't know what to do. This was my IKEA frame. Yeah, we know that frame. Well, it's discontinued. I don't know what to do. So because I'd been there a zillion times, because he's looking to form a relationship with me, he offered this great program for artists. Um, I had to buy a box of molding from him. And a box is like 16 sticks that are 12 feet long. And I had to pay shipping. I had to pay for the whole box up front. I had to store it in my garage. And when I needed frames, I would take the sticks out and drive them to his shop, sticking out my window, you know what I mean? <laughs> and I would be like, I need four 10 by 10s. And he would cut and join them. But I had already paid for the frame, which I never would have been able to buy on my own, you know, from these established frame companies. Um, and I was charged the joining fee, a piece of glass, and um, archival backing, and matting. And I upgraded to this frame, um, which I really liked. And it was an upgrade from that IKEA junk, okay? So now this is um, American molding ma picture manufacturer or something like that. Nice distressed gold, nice dark edge, right? Um, small, classic, gold, silver, black, white. They go with anyone's kind of woodwork. If you're framing for you, yes, match your cabinets, match your whatever, right? But we're framing for artists to sell, right? We want to do black. Uh, I already said it, I don't want to repeat and be silly. So I thought this was kind of nice. You get your dark edge, you get the nice light, you get contrast. A square is modern. It's not very floofy. My work isn't very floofy. You know what I mean? Like, I don't want something frilly. I also just want something clean and modern, right? Um, so this was my frame when I would pick it up from Preservation Framer, right? Glass, I would get, like, I would get sets of them. It would be all joined, nothing together. You know, so joined is the corners. So he would saw it down and with the miter, and he would join them with these cool, pneumatic stapler thing. So I bring it home and then I use my fancy schwandangle tape and I do a hinge on it. Then I put the archival back and then I have the Fletcher gun, right, which is for framers points. And I got this online somewhere. I think I got it used on eBay. And my frame shop in Norwood, I buy points from her periodically. You can also buy them on eBay. 
eBay is a crazy resource for museum glass too. So, you know, you just landed this crazy thing, you need 12, nine by 12 pieces. You do a Google search or something or an, or an eBay thing like museum glass nine by 12, they can sell you bulk sheets at cost. Like I saw once five by seven, like a hundred five by seven sheets of museum glass. Now I gave you the price of $42 for an eight by 10. It was a crazy price. And I remember being like, oh my God, I need a hundred sheets. You know, I don't, thank God. You know, and my husband would be like, what are you doing? Yeah. Um, but research your options. You know, sometimes like we were saying, if you're trying to videotape something, Glass is a nightmare, so museum glass, if you can get it at the right price, is such a good option. My God, sidebars all over the place, I'm sorry. So, right, punch it in. I have this other great linen framing tape. It's, um, you have to wet it, so I have a wet sponge. I cut it to the length, so I do the framer's points, right, and then I um, finish it off, put in the screw eyes. I learned. Don't put the screw eyes in the back if you can help it on your frame because then you pile them up and they go right through and bang the bejesus out of the frame below, right? Or at least then if you have that little screw eye thing, like put something over it for your transport, you know? So you can't always do that based on your frame. Sometimes you have the little screw eye thing for the hanger over here. Um, you know, design like a little piece of cardboard that's part of your packaging. Uh, also, you people, you need to buy this, right? What is this cool stuff, right? <laughs> this is banding, like easy bander. It's just, you know, like cling film. It is heaven, right? So I bought a box of this molding that I only had seen like this. And I was like, oh yeah, this is pretty. This is nice quality, right? But then I got it home and it like got a ding on it. And I was like, oh my gosh, how is that gonna transport? I'm hoping this is my new Ikea bread and butter. Like, what am I gonna do? So this banding tape fortified it for travel, you know? So I've got this down, right? Like I do this, ta -da, twice, right? Do you use bubble wrap? Sometimes. But this, right? So I did it twice around and then I zoom, zoom, zoom. And then I pull it down, right? Oh, look at that. Now, if I stack them together, there's a really nice resist, like that doesn't slide. Nice. Right? And it's protected. And let's say I have those little screw eye things. I can go around a ton over there, you know, like make it into some sort of picture framing mummy and save it, you know? Um, it's so important. I bought this online from this place called Web Restaurant Store or something. A box of 16 rolls, you know, like maybe this, I should have brought those in, like Caleb Stone brought in the, you know, I should have brought in my box and been like, $10 each. Yeah. No, 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 no. But I mean, I think they worked out to inexpensive when you're done. And if you're framing for artists, you save so much money because you know how much it kills you when the frame gets scratched and you have to start over. What kind of tape? What is this is called Easy Bander. Easy Bander. Yeah. Yes. I don't think so. I don't think so. They might, but you know you'd get gouged. Okay. So that's my, okay, my business card, a little description. Inside is how it's framed, so if it's taken apart, a little note. Um, this has an archival mat, archival hinging, and it has a dust trap on the bottom which is just another small piece of archival matting, archivally taped with um, that double-sided archival framers tape in the bottom so that in theory, if something bangs on it, it'll fall down and hit in between the pastel and that. Okay, so this is my six by six, my mainstay. If this doesn't sell, or if I, you know, I can take it out, put a different six by six in, you know. I might do, I do a bunch of 12 by 24s because that's a standard size now. If I'm doing a 12 by 24 and I hate how it's coming out, 
generally somewhere in that 12 by 24, I can find a 12 by 12 that I like. 12 by 12 is a standard size, you know. I have a bunch of 12 by 12s. I hate this. It's not selling. I'm done. Take it out. Put in a different 12 by 12. You know, stay standard. Um, this, and you know, here's the little, if you can see beyond the easy bander, right? Um, this is this frame that I got from Preservation Framer, like when I ordered that 10 that they posted on Facebook, right? Clean and easy. It feels more um, museum-y, right? Like fine art without a big mat that then becomes a little distracting. Again, the dark edge, right, with the nice sil warm silver frame. Um, so you get your contrast, your lights, your darks. You have this nice space, the visual rest, you know, that's important. And sometimes, you know, I'll fit them myself, and sometimes I'll have the frames and I'll bring them to the frame shop and be like, can you just fit them for me? You know, you pick your battles, so. Um, but sometimes you do some series that's just fun, and then you're like, oh my god, I don't know what to do. So Julie at the frame shop had a bunch of these frames, right? They're like this crazy, um, Right, uh, shadow boxy. So I did a bunch of art supplies and she framed it beautifully. And I think in this instance, I was all okay with, I don't care, it's brown. You know what I mean? Like this was a lark for me, it was something different. And in a series, they just looked really pretty. And because she bought these at a fraction from a frame shop, you know, that was going out of business or changing their molding. Um, she got these for a song, she passed that on to me. So I was able to sell these for like $125 and still make a decent amount of money. Do you know what I mean? So get to know your frame shop, I guess, right? Um, I hope I haven't lost you, but, um, so I was saying you have a strategy for framing, right? So I have my small pieces with a mat. Like I don't need it to always be this square. When I ordered that um, box of molding, I could have it in any size, you know. I just always generally did this 10 by 10. Um, but I could have the mats cut any size. I could do some sort of long vertical if I wanted, something funky, you know. Um, so I do do pieces with matting. You saw that I do pieces without matting, right? Um, and then, like from Julie at the frame shop in Norwood, I also get the small version of this silver. And I do a bunch of five by seven, six by eights in oil and pastel, and I order them in bulk from her. Uh, fives at a time, six from a time, and she gives me a really nice price because of the bulk. And I fit these myself, right, with the little screw eyes and again the artist tape and the archival backing. I entered this show in California and um, part of the show was that you had to frame with him. These gallery people are so smart, you know. This was the frame that he what, sold. Me, what part of the show was what? Um, you had to frame with him. Right, so the gallery owner was oh. very smart. It was this six squared show, so everyone had to do six by six pieces and get juried in. So I submitted two pieces, and um, so I sent them to them, and then he framed them per his interest. You know, he had this great deal though, like this crazy ready-made frame at six by six that he sold at his uh, shop. You guys might know him better as King of Frame or Randy Higby Gallery, another frame shop that you should like on Facebook, even though he's in California. Um, museum glass, spacers, honking frame, fit very nicely. I think this deal was like $40, you know. Um, yes, right? And so when I sell for $225 or something, and the gallery takes a cut and you get like, you know, you're all right. What I don't like, though, is it's raised, so you'll see, like, you know, the oh, packing paper always tears. So that's why I like doing the archival tape and just keeping things clean, you know, so that there's um, a space. Because this dust cover is kind of aesthetic at this level, you know, and that tape will keep things out. Um, but nothing looks worse, right, than selling yeah. someone something with their ripped back, right? Um, Sawtooth hangers, hate them. Galleries hate them. And they just wreck the bejesus out of your other frames. So try not to use them. 
Um, every time I'm at a yard sale or a flea market, I look for antique awls, and I use those all the time in my framing. So uh -huh. all the time. I've also framed. I've painted them. You know, given my all. And so. <laughs> So then I'll be painting plein air, right? And I have this little kit, and in my kit, like, because I'll have frames. Because you know, someone walks along and they're like, oh my god, you're painting my house. Well, yes, I am. Yeah. Um, how much? Um, so I have the frame because I already know the size that I'm painting and I have my consistent framing strategy, right? So in my little kit, I have like scissors, I have my business card that I stick to the back, uh, wire, the screw eyes, the whole thing. So you can frame on the fly, right? Ooh, ooh. <laughs> right? Um, so Preservation Kramer, okay, uh, if you go there and you do some, um, hey, I'm an artist, I saw Kim at Fox Bar Art Association and I'd like to talk to someone about some bulk framing. This isn't, I go in with one piece and hey, I'm looking for a price because you know, everyone needs the best price they can get. You know, this is establishing a relationship and uh, they are really wonderful about befriending artists they have a great display space they have very active shows that um have live music and refreshments and the guys who own it are just so great um and not to disdain any others it's these are the ones that i have used and had such a good time with you know um he offers um matt who does the gallery stuff this frame here which you saw on my pieces and the smaller version in silver and in gold he also i think has it in like a dark wood kind of color like frank uses he has it um this one that's just plain as day black and then plain as day white each in both of these sizes you know um, and these are artist frames so if you go in and you have this special card that's been like embossed just for me to give to whoever thinks that they're going to use it It'll entitle you to some really great prices. And I'm not kidding, like, this is a huge deal, you know. Um, and it's usually only if you, you know, do the whole courting. But I've already done that for you. Um, and then Julie at, in Norwood, you know, like, if you have a little bit of time and you can order something in bulk and give her, um, you know, a couple weeks or so to get something, uh, I have this coupon for $10 off any frame order. Do me a favor though, and don't go in there and spend ten dollars only. Do you know what I mean? Like this is kind of with an understanding that you're going to be placing some sort of order that's substantial. You know what I mean? Um, so that might be everything. I have pencils, coupons, <laughs> um, frame raffle, my business. Um, so, a lot of good frame shops and galleries have Art Scope, which is a very nice local art magazine. Preservation Framer recently did a really nice ad in here. Um, look, nice full page thing. And uh, I brought it in because I wanted you to see their display space. Really beautiful display space. You know, they have this great brick wall. It just feels so fun. And there's a great restaurant almost next door. Um, so, uh, any questions? Yes. When you wire painting, is there a rule of thumb how far down the wire should be in the top? A third. And keep it quasi taut. And you know there's a trick to wiring, right? Um, how can I maybe teach it? So you know you have your loop, you know, the hook thing. So you put, I used to just put it in and then wrap it around the bejesus, right? No. Put it in and around and through your opening and then around. So basically you have to almost knot it first and then it won't slide. And I see a lot of knowing looks. So maybe you guys were all onto that before I even knew. But anyway, so it's kind of a little framer's knot. And again, then when your gallery in California is taking it apart, they're oh, look, they even know the framer's knot. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> thinking about you a lot, that gallery that doesn't exist. You know. Um, okay. Any other questions? 
All right, well, I'm available. If you have questions, you can take my business card and always even email or call. Thank you. Yes, Thank you very much. Same, about the same frame.